Welcome to our Hugh Ross weekend. We're so excited to worship with you. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea. Stars in the sky and you know them by 
on, let's give the Lord a hand tonight. Father, we thank you, Lord. We love you. We bless your name, Jesus. Lord, it is our honor, our privilege, it is our pleasure to bless the name of the Lord, to praise you, Jesus, to remember you, to acknowledge you in all that we do. God, we bless you. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, welcome to Grace Church. It's good to see you tonight. Do me a favor, turn around, give somebody a high five. Give them a nice compliment. Tell them how good they look. Up in the balcony as well. If you're online, we'd love to hear from you tonight, where you're watching from. Drop down there in the comment where you're viewing from tonight, if you will. So glad you're here tonight. It's going to be an incredible night. If you will, go ahead and, and pull out your bulletin. I just want to highlight a couple things here before we get started. We've had a really packed last night, all day today. You're going to hear more about that here in just a second. Just to, just take a look. You know, we always have uh, so many good things. I'd love to go through each and every one of them. We don't have time to do that. But just make sure you take a glance at the things that are happening. Uh, we have stuff happening almost seven days a week around here. There's classes and groups, outreaches, ways to give, uh, your time, your talents, and things like that. Don't, don't miss that. If you're online, you can check out our website as well. If you're newer around here, we would love to hear from you and love to pray for you if there's any way we could pray for you. There are connect cards here in the, the seat uh, in front of you and up in the balcony as well. If you're online, you could text the word connect. It's an easy way to find out more about who we are as a church, what we believe, why we do what we do, who is Jesus, the gospel, why do we do the things that we do as Christians in the church. We'd love to interact with any questions you may have or if you have a prayer request. You know, we always say around here, we're not meant to go through the hard times of, of life alone. The body of Christ is the family of God, and we will come around you and pray for you in any way that we can. You can take that Connect card and, and drop it off on your way out at any of the information booths around the campus or any of the offering boxes as well. And those that came ready to give, your tithes or your offerings, you can give those as well on your way out the door uh, tonight. Well, the biggest thing I wanted to highlight tonight is this coming Tuesday. Here in just a few days, we have election day. Our midterm elections are happening, and this is when we as the church, we must do our due diligence in being a responsible citizen in the, the nation that God has put us in to contend for the welfare of that nation. And the way we contend for the welfare of that nation is voting for God-fearing people that will serve and bless and stand up for biblical principles and values. So this Tuesday, be as whatever we have to do. I know sometimes it's inconvenient. Man, we got this happening and this happening. We have to make time to get into the polls this Tuesday and vote. Our civic engagement team over the last many months has been doing lots of work to help inform us and edu educate us on various amendments that will be uh, on Tuesday that we'll be voting for, several amendments that we'll be voting for, the various judges that we'll be voting for, various uh, seats in, in public service that we'll be voting for from senators and representatives in your specific district. We've done the legwork, and I would appeal to you to take advantage of that. Get on our website. Look at our civic engagement page. Get informed. Don't just go and vote, well, this is the way I've always voted. Those days are gone. We have to be a people that are informed and voting with our conscience and voting with the Bible that, again, we would see God-fearing people with a spine and a backbone stand up for the Lord and biblical values in this day and hour. So let's show up as a church on Tuesday and vote. Also, some of our civic engagement team will be just outside these doors in the corner booth here uh, this evening as well to ask or to answer, to interact with you on any questions that you may have about various amendments. I'm telling you, the team is informed. They do a lot of research in this area. Uh, so take us uh, up on that. Okay, let's pray, and we're gonna get right to our guest tonight. We've got an incredible night planned. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for church. We thank you, Lord, that we live in America and that we get to make our voices heard by voting. God, we ask that you would inspire us and stir us and convict us. Lord, we ask that tonight as we uh, set before your word and consider 
the, the complexities and the, the, the wonder of the Trinity. Lord, that you would provoke hunger in our hearts for the Bible, for the presence of the Lord. Lord, to acknowledge your ways in all that we do. God, we thank you, we love you, we, we pledge our lives to you, and we commit to give of our time, our talents, our offerings. Lord, as we ask, as we do that, we pray that the name of Jesus would be glorified here in St. Louis, across our state of Missouri, and in America. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Well, Grace, I need you to do a, a, me a big favor tonight. Let's give a huge warm welcome to Dr. Hugh Ross. Hugh, if you'll come on up and join me tonight. Come on now, somebody. This guy has been such a blessing to the body of Christ. Yes, yes, yes. Hugh has been a, a frequent guest here at Grace Church. I think four or five, I don't know what number of visits this is, but been several visits. This one was unique. You got to bring your whole team. Now, right. if you're unaware with who Hugh is, he's a really smart guy. He's an astrophysicist. He uh, leads up a ministry in Los Angeles called Reasons to Believe where he has gathered scholars in different fields of study. I mean, we have an ethics and philosopher professor, another astrophysicist. We've had a biochemist with fuzz. So this time, he brought his whole team with him, and we started last night, did two sessions, lots of Q&A, did two more sessions this morning, and then you're gonna teach tonight on the complex, or what, what's, what's the title of it? Relating, there it is, Relating to the Trinity, and then tomorrow, an entire different message. What are you preaching on tomorrow? Designed to the core. Designed to the core. So come back again tomorrow. It's gonna to be an entirely uh, different uh, a, a sermon. Now tonight's unique in all kinds of ways, so I, I gotta lay out kind of what we're doing. Hugh's gonna teach for about 30 minutes, and as he does, we're, you, maybe he, he says something that provokes you or you need, I need another two or three sentences on that, Hugh. You, you moved on and you really perplexed me with that. We're gonna have the, no, the number up here that, the, to text in your questions. If you have any questions, we're gonna take the last 25 or so minutes of the service tonight and be able to ask him all kinds of questions. And I, and I know Hugh, he would say, don't, it doesn't have to be limited to what he teaches on. You can ask him a question about anything as it relates to literally anything, Bible, science, the universe, and we'll have Q&A that will end. And then, gets even better. We're gonna end the service tonight, our normal time, and then he has all of his scholars that are gonna be with him, and out in the atrium tonight after service, we're having a really nice uh, dessert reception. We've had several out-of-town guests that have been in for the conference the last couple days, but anybody here for church tonight is more than welcome to come as well. Out in the atrium, we get desserts and, and a time to interact with the scholars and ask them questions then as well. So this is really a, a cool privilege to be able to have some of these top scientists in our midst and to be able to get close to them and say, hey, how has your field of study actually led you to Jesus, not away from Jesus, and it's led them to the reliability of scriptures as well. So Hugh, we're glad that you're here. Well, thank you. Praise God. Now, you, you always bring such a strength to our faith. I'm gonna pray for him and cut him loose and then we'll continue on. Lord, we thank you for Hugh Ross and Kathy and, and their team. And Lord, tonight we ask you that you would anoint him to teach us and to equip us and provoke us to hunger for your presence and for the Bible. Give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, I've been here with uh, four of our staff scholars. Uh, we have five full-time staff scholars at Reasons to Believe, but we also have a community of 165 scholars around the world in all the different disciplines that work with us to be a force to bring people to faith in Jesus Christ at all academic levels. Now, I was born, raised, and educated in Canada. I didn't really get to meet Christians until I showed up at Caltech. I did see a couple of Christians. Uh, I'm a Gideon convert. There was a Gideon Bible that brought me to faith in Christ after two years of studying it. Uh, but it took several more years before I finally met someone who was a serious Christian. This happened at Caltech. I arrived there to begin my postdoctoral research studies on quasars and galaxies. 
and I had to share an office with an Australian astrophysicist who was a very committed atheist. And he had to walk through my office to get to his office. And uh, I remember the first day I showed up, he saw a Bible on my desk, and he said, you're not one of those Bible-thumping Christians, are you? I said, I've never thumped anybody with this Bible. <laughs> uh, but the next day, he came in with a question. In fact, what happened for an 18-month period, he would go through my office and always ask me a question about the Bible, about the science, and the Christian faith. But after I would answer his question, come coffee time, he would go down to the coffee room and he would relate to all the other astronomers and physics professors there what I'd shared with them and they'd all laugh at my expense. So this is going on day after day for 18 months. But then came a day when Ian Lockhart walked into that coffee room and said, I can no longer ridicule Hugh Ross or the Bible or Christians because last night I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And my office was right above the coffee room. For 30 minutes, all I heard was coffee being slurped. Not a single word <laughs> was being mentioned. But there were several Christians there. In fact, what I realized is some of the most famous astronomers in the world were Bible-believing Christians. But they would have me come into their office, and they'd say, close the door. And when the door was closed, they would tell me that they were a Christian, they were going to a certain church, but they said, promise me you'll never tell anybody else here at Caltech I'm a Christian. I said, why? And they said, well, unlike you, I can't defend my faith scientifically, so please uh, don't expose me. But there was one Christian there who joined me in sharing his faith with the other engineers and astronomers there. And as I was sharing this afternoon, there came a time when Dave Rodstad said, Hugh, have you ever thought about sharing your Christian faith with non-scientists? I said, well, where do you find these non-scientists? <laughs> and he said, well, you need to walk off the Caltech campus. I took him at his word. He was really astounded that I took him literally. I literally walked off the campus, looked for people in the street, and started talking to them. And I remember this first guy I talked to. After about 10 minutes, he said, stop, I've heard enough. I said, look, I'm not trying to push my faith on you. Uh, fine, uh, I'll, I'll walk away. He says, I don't want you to walk away. I've heard all the evidence I need. You need to tell me what I need to do in order to become a follower of Jesus Christ like you. So he prayed right there in the street. Well, that same astrophysicist Dave Rogstad said, Hugh, I know in Canada you had a really hard time trying to find a Bible-believing church. In fact, over a seven-year period, I couldn't find a single Bible-believing church. I didn't know how to find them. And he says, well, I can help you find a Bible-believing church. In fact, he gave me a list of six churches in the Pasadena area that were Bible-believing churches. He says, try them out. I did. And I chose one of those churches, and I began attending it. And after a few months, they said, would you be willing to lead a class? And this is a church that's between Caltech, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and just a few miles away from the headquarters of the Skeptic Society. So you can imagine the kind of people that were coming to our church. And I launched a class for skeptics. It's called Paradoxes. In fact, I'm still leading that class to this day. Now it's been more than four decades that I've been teaching that class. But I started teaching the class, and the pastors at the church said, uh, would you be willing to consider a pastoral position? So they brought me on the pastoral staff. And my job was to train people uh, how to use the book of nature to bring people to the book of scripture into relationship with Jesus Christ. And how I would train people is I would say, well, let's just go cold turkey door to door and talk to people. And a lot of people were really ranting, look, I don't want to be like the Jehovah's Witnesses or like the Mormons. Says, no, we're not going to do that. We're never going to mention our church. We're simply going to give people the opportunity to dialogue with us on their spiritual issues. Everybody's got spiritual issues. So we would take people out two by two and go into neighborhoods, knock on people's doors, and we'd ask them questions like, uh, do you pray? Do you think prayer is important? Um, do you read the Bible? And what was interesting, almost everybody would tell us, yes, I've read the Bible. And we'd say, have you read the entire Bible? Yes, I've read the entire Bible. Can you name four books of the Bible? 
they would struggle to name two. They couldn't name four books of the Bible. But it kind of got them thinking, maybe I'm not as spiritually up as I think I am. And then we just say, you know, if you've got questions, we're here. And they'd say, yeah, we got questions. And they would often invite us in. But I can remember one Saturday afternoon, uh, we spent four hours in three homes. On the other side of the street were the Jehovah's Witnesses. They knocked on 200 doors, and nobody was willing to talk to them. But I remember we came out of the third home, and they came over to talk to us, and they said, what are you doing that we're not doing? Because we noticed everybody invited you in. I said, they not only invited us in, they fed us. So, <laughs> and they said, that never happens. So we got to share with those Jehovah's Witnesses that people can appreciate when they're being presented the truth, and they can appreciate when it's being presented with gentleness and respect and humility. That's the key. Well, literally every Saturday we would go out. At least one, if not several people, would come to faith in Jesus Christ. I remember one of our young men that went out, he came back and said, well, Hugh, I didn't just lead one to Christ. I led 13 to Christ this day. Because I was talking to this teenage boy, and he said, stop, I want to call all my friends over. And so he got to lead 13 uh, uh, teenage uh, boys uh, to faith in Jesus Christ. And so we began to plant these home Bible studies. And because uh, we would tell them, you know, we never promoted our church. We said, down the block, there's a Bible study. If you want to learn more about the Bible, you can come. And uh, you can ask any question you want. And so we wound up planting these Bible studies. And they would get up to 40 people. One of them got up to 60 people. And it got to a point where we say, you know, we got six big Bible studies in this one small community, and we use that to plant a church. And the astrophysicist I mentioned, Dave Rogstad, he's one of the teaching elders of that church that we planted. Now, what I'm going to share with you this evening is that, you know, we were leading all these adults to faith in Jesus Christ, and they had issues, they had questions. I mean, a lot of them had never really looked at the Bible before. And so what I want to share with you is a message I developed 40 years ago, a short message that we would design for people that have just given their life to Jesus Christ, and they want to know, how do I relate to this God? And what is this concept of the Trinity? That just seemed mysterious to them. And so that's the subject of the talk, relating to the Trinity. And the first question I would get, oh, by the way, uh, we're actually giving away a free book. Uh, you can scan this code, and you'll get a copy of our latest book. It's out of the table. You can walk away with it. Uh, it's a book called Testing Faith, Testable Faith, written by three of our scientists and one of our philosophers. So yeah, before you leave tonight, uh, pick up that free book. But the question I would frequently get from these people who just prayed to receive crisis, what about those who've never heard? You ever heard that question? What about those who've never heard? And so I would take them to the book of John, and right in the very first chapter, what does it say? The light of God shines in the darkness. So God's light has penetrated the spiritual darkness of the world. And it tells us that the true light that gives light to everyone. There's a promise there in the Gospel of John that God's light goes out to every single human being, every man, woman, and child, in every culture, in every background, all around the world. And it's something you see in Romans chapter 1. God reveals himself through the creation. He not only reveals his existence, he reveals all of his personal attributes. So we can tell it's not just any God, it's the God of the Bible because of how clearly God has revealed himself uh, through the creation. But the other thing you see in the Gospel of John is uh, God sends out his light to every human being, and if that human receives that light, God will send more light. But there's also a warning. If you reject the light that God gives to you, you're going to find it more difficult to receive any additional light from God. So receiving light from God, there's a promise, you'll get more light. So people say, well, what about those who don't have Bibles? Well, if they respond to the light that God gives them to the record of nature, God guarantees that he will give them more light. And I've read 
so many accounts of stories of people who responded to the light through the book of nature and down the road, uh, God got them to people who knew the scriptures and knew the life of Jesus Christ. You will get more light. But if you reject the light that God gives you, then it becomes more challenging to receive any more light. As it says, light has come into the world, and whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. So there we get another condition. If you're willing to acknowledge that truth indeed is truth and something you need to embrace, that's also an open door to receiving more light from God. And I would explain this to these new Christians. And the question I'd always got is, well, this is great. We're getting light from God, but please tell me, what is that light I'm getting from God? Uh, I know it's not electromagnetic radiation. I got that from the people that are engineers. They said it's not electromagnetic radiation. What is the light of God? <clears throat> well, John did not only write a gospel, he wrote three letters. And his first letter, 1 John, it's basically a letter designed for brand new Christians. And so I would literally take these new Christians through the five chapters of John's letter, 1 John. And if you open up uh, the letter, uh, a 1 John letter, it says in chapter one, God is light. So you read chapter one, God is light. But then as you go into chapter two, three, and four, it tells us what that light is. God is light, and chapter two is all focused on the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. And it tells us that the role of God the Son with us as human beings is to bestow life. He's the one that gives us life. And then you get into chapter three, and it says God the Father bestows love. So the role of the Father is to give us love, and then in chapter four, it tells us the Spirit bestows truth. And so we have these three persons. I mean, the doctrine of the Trinity is basically summed up as one essence and three persons. So three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But when it says one essence, it means that the character attributes of the Son are identical to the character attributes of the Father and identical to the character attributes of God the Spirit. So three persons, but you're getting a single mind, a single purpose, a single plan from all three. They don't disagree with one another. They have a single essence, a single purpose, but because there's three persons, they can divide their labor. And so the Son bestows life, the Father bestows love, and the Spirit bestows truth. So here's the equation for you. I, I haven't given any equations this weekend, but here's an equation for all of you. God's light equals God's life, God's love, plus God's truth. So whenever you see the New Testament speaking about the light of God, that's what it means. It means a combination of life, truth, and love. Now, what about this doctrine of the Trinity? Because a question I would get from these new Christians is, does it have to be the God of the Bible? After all, we got the gods of these other religions. You got Judaism, don't they follow the same God? Well, what you notice is, in all the non-Christian religions, and you know, we would be going door to door, we'd be running into these Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, and what we would tell these new Christians, there are Christian cults. Jehovah's Witness is a Christian cult that's based on the Bible, but they deny the doctrine of the Trinity. And that's something else you see in 1 John. It says, here's how you can tell who a true follower of Jesus Christ is. Do they acknowledge the key doctrines of the Trinity? Do they believe that Jesus is simultaneously human and divine? The humanity of God and the divinity of God uh, combine into just the one person, uh, God the Son. But do they believe in this triune God? And that's the test we would tell them. Here's how you can determine whether you're in a church that is cultic, do they deny the doctrine of the Trinity? That's a simple test. So what is this Trinity? Three persons, one essence. But what I would share with them, I'm a research scientist, and science only makes sense from a triune perspective. Let me unpack that for you. We have religions that believe that God is a single person. Judaism is in that category, 
Islam is in that category. God is one. <clears throat> and our staff philosopher, Ken Samples, and I have been involved in debates with Islamic apologists and Jewish apologists. And as soon as we get an opportunity, we ask them, how do you explain the origin of love? Because love, by definition, is one person expressing love to another person or receiving love from that person. And so the problem with Islam and Judaism is that God must create in order to experience love. One person with no creation, there is no love. Christianity makes sense because it has an explanation for the origin of love. You've got the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a loving relationship with one another where they're expressing love to one another, receiving love from one another, enjoying a relationship with one another. They don't need to create. Creation is an option. It's not a necessity. And you know, one of the mantras of Islam is, there's nothing greater than God. But I say there's a problem with your mantra because we human beings experience love and before God created anything, he could not experience or express love in your theological perspective. But in the Christian perspective, God is already experiencing, expressing, receiving love before he creates anything at all. Creation is an option, it's not a necessity. But then there's those religions where they have many gods. And you know, I was raised in an Asian neighborhood in Vancouver, British Columbia. We had lots of Buddhists, we had lots of um, uh, Confucius followers, uh, we had uh, Hindus. And what you see in those religions, is there's multiple gods. In Hinduism, they have over three million gods. And if you look at what you see in the Hindu Vedas, uh, they are basically saying, when we study the realm of nature, it's going to be filled with incongruities, inconsistencies, and contradictions. Why? Because you've got multiple gods involved in creation, and they all got different ideas on how to create. And so we would anticipate, uh, from an Eastern religion perspective, that science is going to be filled with all these inconsistency, incongruities, but in fact, that's not what we see. Uh, we look at science, we see that it's harmonious, it is consistent, and the different scientific disciplines don't contradict one another, they fill all together. It's reliable, it's trustworthy. Why? Because it comes from a creator that has a single plan, a single purpose, a single mind, a single objective. Science only makes sense uh, from a Trinitarian perspective. And I found that this is really helpful with new Christians just realizing, okay, now I begin to understand who God is and why it has to be the God of the Bible and not any of the gods of the other religions of the world. But what they're really eager to do is to find an intimate, loving relationship with this creator that they committed their life to. Because after all, we lead them to faith in Jesus Christ, or we're basically telling them, this is the day when you receive the offer from the creator of the universe to forgive you of all of your sins, not just your past sins and your present sins, it's past, present, and future. You see that in the first chapter of 1 John, that God forgives all of your sins when you commit your life to him, and God wants to give you an eternal relationship with him. And often when I speak to these new Christians, they say, well, when did this relationship with God begin? They had this idea that we have to finish our life here on earth first, and then we pass on into glory, then we have the relationship. I said, no, that's not the way it works. God wants a relationship with you immediately. As soon as you give your life to Jesus Christ, receive the forgiveness of your sins, put him in charge of your life, realizing he knows better than you do what's best for you, so you make him the master of your life, that's where the relationship begins. They say, well, how do I begin this relationship? I say, well, recognize that God has given us a transcendent tool, the tool of prayer. It's the most powerful tool that God has granted uh, to humanity. We can give more of God's light. Prayer is the most powerful tool that God has given to his people. It's the one tool where you can have an impact on any event uh, within this planet Earth. You can be praying for somebody in South Africa and you can have an impact on their life. 
and it's not constrained by the laws of physics or the velocity of light. God can hear your prayer from across the universe and beyond, answer it immediately, and impact things that are going on. And so, well, how do I use this tool of prayer? When we try to get these new Christians involved in prayer right away, uh, but we're very careful on instructing them how this prayer relationship with the Creator uh, should begin. Prayer is so powerful a tool that God has given us detailed instructions on how to pray and how not to pray. Now, I've learned being a pastor now for more than four decades, this is something that not only new Christians need to hear, I've met people who have been walking with the Lord for 30 years, and they need these instructions too. So in our church, we repeatedly remind people of the detailed instructions that God gives us about prayer, because we're eager that their prayer life would be fulfilling and intimate and loving in getting their relationship with Jesus Christ uh, in a more productive fashion. The first thing that Jesus says about prayer, do not pray like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So you notice that they're repeating the same prayers over and over again. And you know, a lot of these people who are leading to faith in Jesus Christ would come out of, say, Catholicism, where they go through the rosary every day, the same prayer day after day after day. And Jesus says, no repetitive prayers. He's basically saying, I heard you the first time. You don't have to repeat your prayer. Well, he's basically saying, what else do you want me to do? And how do you want me to do it? He wants us to get specific about our prayers. And when it tells us, when he says no repetition, he also says no babbling. The Greek word for babble there is no long-winded, vacuous prayers, um, you know, where people go on and on and on in their prayer, but there's not a lot of content in the prayer. And again, God wants us to be brief. He wants us to be specific. And so no babbling, no long-winded prayers. And I've been in prayer meetings where I've had to stop an individual and say, let me read you a passage from the book of Matthew. They say, okay, I understand. I've been too long-winded in the prayer. I need to give everybody else a chance to pray. The other problem with long-winded prayers, you need to let God speak. Prayer is a two-way relationship. We talk to God, he wants to talk back to us. But if all we're doing is these long-winded, vacuous prayers, he's got no opportunity to interrupt. Give him an opportunity to interrupt. And what I would recommend is when you have your prayer meetings, whether it be one-on-one -on -one with God in your closet or as a group, make sure you have pauses where you allow God to speak back to you. Lord, is there something you want to tell me at this moment? And have that moment of pause. Let him speak. Okay. <clears throat> Eschew orientation, ostentation, and pride. And here Jesus is referring to these Pharisees that would go into a very public place and they would you know, go through these motions and everybody would say, wow, look how holy they are. They're praying and they're praying for a whole hour. He says, no show. If you want to get serious about your prayers with God, do not do it in an ostentatious or prideful way. In fact, he made a story, a parable, where he had this man praying and say, Lord, I thank you. I'm not a sinner like this man over here. He says, never do that. We need to be humble before God and admit that we're in need of a God's help. We're to confess our sins. And I love what the King James does. King James, instead of using the word you, uses the word thee and thou. Thou is you in the singular, thee is you in the plural. And there you recognize it's commanding us, we're to pray just between us and God, but we're also to pray in groups. And you know, I run into these new Christians and say, hey, you're supposed to go into your closet and it's to be private. Yes, we're supposed to do that, but that's not the only kind of prayers we're to be doing. We need to be gathering a group. We also need to be doing it privately, just between us and God. And we're to be confessing our sins. Instead of pointing out the sins of everybody else, we need to confess our own sins. And I think part of prayer life is basically saying, God, I know you know me better than I know myself, I don't know all my sins. I don't see all my sins, but you see everything. You know all my thoughts from beginning to end. Please expose sins in my life I'm not aware of. And I'll tell you something. God is really eager to answer that prayer. He will do that. 
You know, I won't do it in ways that you might enjoy, because typically what he does is he'll bring somebody in your life to expose a hidden sin in your life. But this is a prayer that God wants us to engage. And basically he's telling us we all need to pray that way because it's guaranteed every one of us has hidden sins that we're protecting. We don't want the people to discover them. But there's another kind of hidden sin. It's sins that we ourselves are not even aware of. And we're to ask the Holy Spirit to expose these hidden sins, as I mentioned. And when we pray for healing, we're to prioritize spiritual healing over physical healing. This is explained in James 5. I'll get to that in a minute. But one passage I've found to be a problem for a lot of new believers is 1 Thessalonians 5.16, where Paul says, Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And these new believers would say, how can anyone live up to that command? How can we be praying 24-7? I said, well, actually look at the context of the passage. It's basically saying, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you should be filled with joy all the time, and we should be thankful. But when we're never always thankful or joyful, basically this passage is saying, if you, as a Christian, reach a point in your life where you're not joyful, you're not thankful, you're depressed, you're despondent, that's basically God tapping you on your shoulder and saying, you need to pray. Because what God wants from his followers is that they be filled with joy and filled with thankfulness. But we all go through those episodes where we don't feel like that way. That's basically God saying, I think you need to pray. Or you need to ask friends to pray for you. Maybe you don't feel joyful, get people to pray for you. So it's a signal. And also it's based on what we see in Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good if we love God and are called according to his purpose. So if you're fulfilling the purpose that God wants you to fulfill in your life and you love the Lord, there's a guarantee whatever happens in your life, it will work together for good. And yes, Jesus said, in this life you'll have tribulation. I like to paraphrase that and say, in this life, you'll have thermodynamics. But take heart, I've overcome thermodynamics. I've overcome the world. He's basically saying, in this creation, you're going to have electromagnetism, gravity, thermodynamics. You're going to see your body decaying away. You're going to see everything around you decaying. That's just the way it is in this universe. And bad things will happen. But he says, if you love me and are called according to the purpose I've called you for, Whatever happens, it'll work for good. And so we need to encourage new believers. This is a promise, put it to the test whenever you're going through a hard time. Now, it might take a decade before you see that good, but just recognize this is a promise from God. And what I tell brand new believers is, look, I know this may be hard for you to accept, but talk to people in our church that have been Christians for 10, 20, 30 years and get stories from them of how really bad things happen in their life, but after time went by, they saw that really good things came out of those bad experiences, and they will always tell you, the good far outweighs the bad. And then, based on their stories, you can begin to trust that that will happen for you too. And when it does happen, be prepared to share with others. People need to hear how the bad things that happen in your life, if you're patient, and love God and work according to his purpose, they will work out for eventual good. And that's an exhortation to all of you out there who've been walking with the Lord for more than a decade. Share with people your experiences of seeing Romans 8.28 work out in your life. We need to do that as we gather together. So when you're having the dessert out there, you might want to find somebody and say, this is what happened in my life 12 years ago and this how it worked out for good. I'm so grateful God took me through that trial, that experience, that tribulation because of the good that I saw come out of it. We need to be sharing stories like that with one another and realize this is a way we can encourage one another to be praying. So be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you and be continually dependent on God, never giving up on praying and basically when it says pray continually, 
It means be on your alert to look for opportunities to pray. Now, I live in the Los Angeles Basin. Every time I get in my car, I got an opportunity to pray. Uh, because, you know, we get stuck in all this traffic, and rather than cursing all these other drivers, they can't hear you anyway. And by the way, when you do that, God hears you, and he's not pleased. You can be praying for all those people. And I actually realize it's going to take me a half an hour to get to work. I'm sitting behind the wheel. Uh, I really can't, uh, you know, work on my computer, but I can pray. I mean, whatever you're doing, whether you're out for a walk, or you're driving your car, uh, that can be an opportunity to pray. I mean, my personal uh, discipline is every morning I go for a short run. But when I do that, I'm praying and thinking through the day and saying, God, how do you want me to organize my day? So when you're doing something that prevents you from doing your work or whatever, use that as an opportunity for praying. Continue to look for those opportunities for prayer. And God has put restrictions on prayer. One of the reasons why we know prayer is such a powerful tool God has told us that we're to be careful how we use this tool. It is such a powerful tool that God has said, be careful how you pray, when you pray, and who you pray for. And so we're not to pray for selfish purposes. Uh, God, make me the wealthiest person in Missouri. No, we're not to pray for selfish purposes. We're not to pray for prideful purposes. Neither are we to pray against God's will. In fact, the promise we got from Jesus, we can pray for anything we want. If it's in accordance with God's will, it will be done. That prayer will be answered. And basically what God is telling us, if you're praying and asking God to do something and there's no answer, the answer is no, that's not my will. Or it's not my specific will. I mean, for example, when I came to faith in Jesus Christ, I started praying for my parents to become followers of Jesus Christ. And I made the mistake of saying the same prayer over and over again, and finally I heard God saying, look, I know you want your parents to come to faith in Christ. I want them to come to faith in Christ. I want to partner with you in this. Tell me, how do you want them to come to faith in Christ? And then I began to realize, God's interested more than just my parents coming to faith in Christ. He's thinking about all the people that they influence. And God has got a detailed plan, and he wants me to partner with him and so I began to pray more and more specifically, realizing, you know, they're not taking it from me. Maybe they need to hear God's truth for someone that's in their generation, someone that's in their economic uh, strata. And so I began to pray that God would bring a Christian couple into their life that was their age and involved in the same hobbies and interests that they were involved in. And God answered that prayer. And that was the beginning of the step of them coming to faith in Jesus Christ. But as I continue to pray for my parents, God was basically saying, okay, uh, we've taken this step. What do you think is step two? What is step three? What is step four? He wanted me to get very detailed. How long did it take? It took 30 years. In their late 70s, both of my parents came to faith in Christ. And I began to see, yes, all things work together for good. It was a trauma for me to wait that long. But having seen what God did, I began to realize if my mother came to Christ before her five close nursing friends came to Christ, they wouldn't have come to Christ. They had to come to Christ first and my mother last. Although my nephew tells me that when my mother was on her deathbed, she led uh, one of her other friends to faith in Jesus Christ. She did a beautiful job uh, leading uh, someone to faith in Christ. God's got his reasons for delaying. He's got his reasons for doing it the way it is, but he wants us to partner uh, with him in that. And we see in 1 John uh, chapter 5, he says there's certain people you're not to pray for. Likewise, there's certain people we shouldn't try to evangelize. And it's basically referring to reprobates. That's a technical biblical term, uh, referring to someone who is incapable of repenting. They're incapable of doing anything good. All they think of is evil all the time, and all that's on their mind is how they can do damage to other people. Uh, Romans chapter 1 ends with this phrase, that these people are evangelists for evil. They're not content to just do evil for themselves. 
they draw and it draw as many other people as possible into the evil that they're expressing. And the Bible is basically telling us these people are dangerous. And getting close to them, uh, you don't overestimate your capabilities of not being damaged by the evil they want to perpetrate upon you. You need to stay away. And these are people like Pharaoh, where it tells us in Exodus that Pharaoh has hardened his heart against God over and over again. And how does it end? It says God hardened his heart against Pharaoh, which basically means that Pharaoh had rebelled against God so consistently and so repeatedly, he was unable to hear and respond to any truth uh, from God at all. Couldn't accept any love from God, couldn't accept any love from people, and basically tells us these are people that are beyond hope. However, I've run into people in my 40 years of ministry that tell me, you know what, I need to divorce my husband, he's a reprobate, and I say, well, have you gone through the Bible, looked up the 57 characteristics of a reprobate? How many of those 57 does your husband really have? Oh, he's got to have all of them. So I say, okay, let me talk to your husband. And I go back to her and say, he really doesn't have any of the 57. Uh, maybe you need to go into marriage counseling. Or I think you might have three, but a reprobate is going to have all 57. And I've written a little paper on God's mercy and death. God does not allow reprobates to live very long because the longer he allows them to live, the more judgment they pile up upon themselves. And God's desire is that they not be judged any to greater degree than is necessary. As it says in Revelation 20, those that reject God uh, will be restrained, will be tormented to the degree of the evil that they have expressed. And so when a person becomes beyond hope, uh, God has no motive in allowing them to pile up uh, more uh, judgment against them. He typically takes their life quickly. There's only, I've met reprobates, but I, maybe I've met two in my entire lifetime. They're rare. Now, in the Old Testament period, there were many more reprobates, but that's because the salt of the earth wasn't present. Jesus said to his disciples, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will become the salt of the earth. And it's that salt that prevents whole cities and towns becoming reprobate. Sodom and Gomorrah existed in the Old Testament. There is no Sodom and Gomorrah that we see in the New Testament because the salt of the earth is present. But there are individuals, but they're rare, and we're warned we're not to pray for those people. And let me just finish off with what it tells us in John, James chapter 5, the prayer of faith. It basically says, if there's any among you that are ill, that could be uh, physically ill, it could be emotionally ill, uh, you could be depressed, it could be spiritually ill. If any of you are ill, call for the elders and have them pray for you, and the prayer of faith will heal. But it also tells us in that passage in James 5 that when we come and ask the elders to pray for us and that we would be healed, it says, confess your sins. So this is something we practice in our church, where we invite people to come and to be uh, prayed for for healing. But in those uh, prayer times, we basically say, we're gonna begin by confessing our sins. The person that comes, we invite them to confess their sins, but we also as elders say, we need to confess our sins. How can we pray for this uh, young man or this elderly lady if we ourselves are holding sins within us? So we do what we can to confess our sins, and then we'll ask the individual, <clears throat> okay, you've been able to confess the sins you know. I know you're here for healing. Do you really want God's healing in your life? And almost always they say yes. Well, will you allow us to pray prophetically? And what I mean by that, will you allow us to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us sins in your life that you're not aware of? And we would see God do miraculous things, exposing things in the person's life. We had this lady had a horrible back pain. She had to crawl into the room where we were praying. Her back pain was so severe, and she was confessing her sins. And we asked her, would you be okay if we uh, pray prophetically? She said, yes. And one of the elders said, how's your relationship with your mother? She immediately began to cry and said, we've had a 10-year falling out. And I said, well, 
we're gonna pray for you and your mother and that that relationship would be healed. And so we prayed for over an hour. And she said, you know, I had no desire to contact my mother until today. I'm gonna call her. She not only called her, she went over to meet with her. It took a couple of weeks, but the relationship got healed. Uh, they're bonded together and her back was healed. The pain went away. So, and the whole point there of James 5 is God's far more interested in spiritual healing than he is physical healing. And you know, we would get these people coming to us and they say, I want a perfect physical healing. I said, well, a perfect physical healing is physical death. You want us to pray for you, you should die on the spot. I said, no, I don't want a perfect healing. I want a partial healing. So, because the whole point is, you can be healed physically, you're still gonna die. Uh, you're still gonna be subject to thermodynamics. This world is filled with tribulation. It's gonna be temporary. But I love what it says in 2 Corinthians 4. It says, look around us. We're all decaying. And it's referring to the physical decay we're experiencing. But you know, you usually have to, you know, I, I will be gone for maybe 10 years. In fact, I met a, a woman here uh, yeah, yesterday hadn't seen her in 10 years, and uh, I could see she decayed a bit. She could see I decayed quite a lot uh, over those uh, 10 years. Uh, but it takes about a decade to notice that decay. But what does it tell us in 2 Corinthians 4? When we're walking with the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit, we can see spiritual healing daily, every day. And you can often see that with Christians. In a single 24-hour period, you can see they're being spiritually transformed. They've become more lovable, they become more attractive. And that's the advantage of being a follower of Jesus Christ. We can rejoice in getting old, because the older we get, though our bodies are decaying, our spirit gets renewed day by day by day. And that's how we're to pray for one another, that we would be allowing the Holy Spirit to transform us on a daily basis, reversing the thermodynamics. It's our bodies that are thermodynamically decaying. God has got anti-thermodynamics where he works on our spirit and builds it up day by day by day. Thank you. I'm gonna call <laughs> rest of you. Okay, and get this uh, book as you walk out. Fantastic, thank you, Hugh. Hey, you're welcome. Um, I just want to jump right in and get you talking from your field of study as an astronomer and astrophysicist. You know, there's so many that hear the saying that science is, you know, leads people away from the validity of Scripture, or I don't believe in God, I believe in science, to, you know, quote good old Nacho Libre, if you're familiar with him. I don't know if you're familiar with him or not, but anyways, how has your science led you to believe in the validity and provoked your faith in the Bible? Well, I'm gonna share a little bit about that uh, tomorrow morning, how we see in Job and Psalms that the more we learn about nature, the more evidence we uncover for the supernatural handiwork of God. And that's especially true in the 21st century. You know, we're told in Daniel chapter 12 that in the last days, knowledge will explosively increase. I believe we're living in those days. My own discipline of astrophysics, the knowledge base doubles every five years, which means in five years we know twice as much about the universe as we know uh, today. And so as I look at the scientific literature, literally on a daily basis, discoveries are being made by scientists that document, that establish, that we have more evidence for the supernatural handiwork of the Creator than we had 24 hours ago. I mean, one of the things I do at Reasons to Believe, I write a weekly blog called Today's New Reason to Believe, where I just kind of pick from the scientific literature and say, I think I'll write about this one. If I had the time, I think I could write a dozen of those a day, but I don't. I only do one a week. Now, it, and on the note of, of science, what's your take on just the current, almost, I see it as a threat or a challenge against some of the objectivity of science. It seems like some of the science that we see, you know, with, I'm, I'm thinking of, of gender confusion, I'm thinking of biology all of a sudden being threatened by, you know, somebody's framework of mind. So do you see a, a threat against some of the objectivity in science? And, and as it's, even in America, in the culture of America right now, what's your take on that? 
Well, my take on that is what uh, we were told by Jesus, we don't in Paul, we don't wrestle just against flesh and blood. There are spiritual powers. I mean, there's an angelic realm. And so if you're wondering why things seem so irrational in our country, well, look at world history. It's always been irrational. You've got people, I mean, take Adolf Hitler. He was making decisions that were counter to his best interests. Uh, you look at Putin today. He's making decisions that are counter to his best interests. What would motivate somebody to make decisions that are against their very best interests? Well, they're being influenced by powers beyond this world. And so we're praying. We need to realize it's not just flesh and blood. And we shouldn't get so disturbed that things are irrational. We would expect them to be irrational if we're dealing with the spirit realm. And this is why we need the two. That's why I spoke on prayer tonight. If we're going to break through on this, we need supernatural assistance. And prayer is that supernatural tool uh, to break through with that. Amen. Good. Yeah, no, amen. You referenced earlier a few other religions, and I, and I know your story, I've heard your story that before you came to faith, you really pretty did an extensive search in other religions. So as an astrophysicist, of course, and studying science and studying the universe, you're, you get a pretty good bead on the history of the world and the creation of the world. In any of the other religions, in their literature, is there an accurate account of creation that, uh, that we find in the Bible? That was my pathway to faith in Jesus Christ, is looking at these other religions, looking at their holy books, and realizing they didn't get it right. I said, if this is from the one that created the universe, the story would be accurate. So the first religion I looked at was uh, Hinduism. There were a lot of Hindus in the high school I went to, and I realized they get everything about the universe wrong. Because in Hinduism, there's this idea of reincarnation. And most of you are aware it talks about the reincarnation of animals and people. But it's fundamentally based on the doctrine, the universe reincarnates. And so in Hinduism, the universe goes through a birth and a rebirth every 4.32 billion years. They actually put a number in there. Well, we know that 4.32 is wrong, uh, but we also know, or at least I knew as a young astronomy student, that there wasn't enough, there was way too much entropy in the universe to produce the kind of rebirth of the universe that Hinduism required. So I said, it's not Hinduism. And I looked at Buddhism and I realized it's the same cosmology. It can't be Buddhism. When I picked up the Bible, it said, here is a book that actually gets it right, uh, that there's a single beginning to the universe that includes a beginning of space and time itself. The laws of physics don't change. One of those laws is a pervasive law of decay. So this is a universe that's going to run down uh, over time. And so, hey, it gets that part right. And I realized, you know, no astronomer knew that until the 20th century. The Bible was saying this thousands of years ago. The account of creation in Genesis 1, I realized, here we got 10 events of creation. I immediately recognized it's all in the correct chronological order, and they're all correctly described. The best I found outside of the Bible was the creation story of the Sumerians. And uh, they described 14 events, and they got two out of 14 right. But I figure, hey, two out of 14 is not a very good score. Uh, that would be an F in my class. Uh, so, uh, but all, we say, what about the rest of them? They all score zero. At least with the Babylonians, they got two out of 14 right. But the Bible gets a perfect score. And, and uh, the books that you've written, what would be your go-to book for somebody really fascinated in the creation account as it relates to the validity of Scripture and then just the study of the universe. What book of yours would That'd you say? That'd be Navigating Genesis, and I know it's out there at the table. Navigating Genesis. Navigating Genesis. Good. Here's a question that come in just on, uh, need a little bit more on when you were talking about prayer. You said not to be repetitive, yet the Lord says, ask and keep asking, seek and keep seeking. Right. And then he exhorts us in Luke 18 with the persistent widow. Yes. So are you, how do, does that contradict what you said? I don't think it contradicts. God is basically saying, Keep on praying, persist in your prayers, but don't repeat the same prayer over and over again. So yeah, you can begin by saying, I want my son to come to faith in Christ. The second time you pray, uh, please, Lord, may one of his friends help guide him towards the truth that you want to reveal to him. And then you get more and more. So being persistent 
is getting down into the nitty-gritty details. When it tells us, pray for anything that you desire, if it's in accordance with my will, it will be done. There's a condition on that. It must be in accordance with his detailed will. And God wants to partner with us. And part of that partnership is discovering that detailed will of God and seeing him answer those prayers and realizing, wow, God actually appreciates me as a partner with him in the ministry he wants. And you say, well, what if you don't do it? God's gonna find someone else to pray. But hey, he wants you to experience that joy of being a partner with him. It's good too. I think too, some of the repetitiveness that I believe that you're hinting towards is where we just go through the motions. You know, God, and I love how you said prayer is, is both talking and pausing and listening. <laughs> and sometimes the repetitiveness that the Lord was rebuking was where we just go through the motions of praying, but our heart is not in it. Well, let it's me give you a specific words. example. I've been in a lot of churches where every Sunday uh, they recite the Lord's Prayer, not realizing the Lord's Prayer is basically a bullet outline. These are the things you should be praying about, not word for word, but realizing this is a topic, and uh, you need to be thinking, okay, going down this bullet list of the Lord's Prayer, what detailed specific that falls into that category do I need to pray about this Sunday or this Friday or this Monday or whatever? Yeah, each point in the Lord's Prayer opens up a whole vein exactly. of things to talk to him about. Good. This is a question that came in about being joyful always. How do you help people who are in a terribly depressing, like a traumatic situation and the circumstances seem overwhelming, yet we're trying to encourage them to be you know, grateful or joyful in all seasons. How do we do that when it's in the heat of the moment? Well, all of us go through those episodes of uh, depression. I mean, some of us, you know, my wife says I'm a Pollyanna. I I'm always looking on the bright side of things. Uh, and that's probably part of my genetics. But other people, it's very easy for them to get despondent and depressed. And first of all, realize there might be a physical reason uh, for your depression. And so, hey, if there's a chemical imbalance, uh, maybe you need to go see a physician and to get that corrected. Uh, but I think with the passage I read there where it says, be joyful always. If you're not joyful, figure out why you're not joyful. Uh, you know, what is it uh, that you've been overlooking? And that's an opportunity to say, hey, maybe I need my friends to pray for me and just say, hey, I'm going through this trauma. And God may be wanting to use that trauma to work out something in your life or the life of somebody else, and the joy will come. Just be patient. And I don't think God is saying, I want you to be joyful when you're going through the horrible pain of cancer. I mean, it's just such a, a traumatic experience. God's not asking that from you, uh, but he's asking you to call for people to pray and that God would work this out for ultimate good, and there will be an ultimate joy that can come from that. We got two more questions, just because I want to honor our time and then get over to the reception. And if you have more, a lot of questions coming in we didn't have time for, the good news is, is all the scholars are going to be out there. Okay, one is going to be on eschatology, and then the next one is going to be just on the, how your heart has been wowed by your study of the universe. So the first one is just on the study of eschatology, which is a fancy word for the, the study of the end times or the second coming of Jesus. I know you've joked before, I think you said you took seven years, your church, in, in teaching through the book of Revelation or some long period like that. Yeah, our church calls that the seven-year tribulation. <laughs> the seven-year tribulation. <laughs> but what is your sense just on timing and events and current events and things that are happening, science? You just quoted Daniel where it talks about the increase of knowledge. What, what is your sense as a scientist, but then also just as a, a study, a, a student of the Bible as, as far as current timing? in the Lord's Well, I return. could ask the question a lot, when is the Lord going to return? I says, well, he's told us when he's gonna return. He'll return when we who are his followers finish the commission that he gave to us. Make disciples of all people groups in the world. And you say, well, how many disciples do we need, need to make in all those people groups? I think he gave us a standard in Zechariah 13, where it prophesies a time will come when one third of all the Jews will become followers of Jesus Christ. And it tells us in Galatians that he treats Gentiles the same way as he does the Jews. And Jesus said, broad is the road that leads to destruction, narrow is the road that leads to salvation. It won't be a majority, 
but it's gonna be a large minority. And so when we actually bring in all the world's people groups, say something on the order of 25 to 35% of the people in all those people groups to become faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, that's when the Lord will return. So instead of us waiting for the return of the Lord, the Lord is waiting for us to finish the task that he gave us to do. And what really encourages me, I think we're close. I mentioned Ralph Winter this afternoon, uh, the founder of the U.S. Center for World Mission. One of the pieces that he wrote was, evangelical Christians today have the finances, the people, and the technology to take the good news of salvation to all the people groups of the world where a large minority in every people group will become disciples of Jesus Christ. We can do that in 10 years. We have the resources. All we lack is a motivation. And I remember having dialogues with him where he would say, you know, if you actually look at the money that people give towards the completion of that Great Commission, uh, it's only a tenth of a percent, averaged over all the evangelicals in the world. He says, if we can get that up to 1%, then it'll be done in a decade. But my response back to Ralph was, well, the vast majority of evangelicals worldwide give zero. And those that do give are very committed. They give between three and 10% of their income. Challenging those people to increase their giving by a factor of 10, that's not realistic. Uh, I'm not in a position to give 70% of my income to the fulfillment of the Great Commission. What we need to do is challenge all those evangelicals that are giving zero to give a little. And I'm hopeful. Uh, I'm hoping that before I pass on uh, to the uh, next life, that I'll actually see the return of Jesus Christ here to planet Earth. That's one reason I'm so committed to train people in the ministry of evangelism. I want to see the Lord come back. Good, good. Okay. Lastly, what, as you study the universe, I, I, you, you've, you've taught on this so much, but give us just one. What would be an area that has wowed your heart as far as God the creator? What, what moves your heart in worship as an astronomer? I'm actually gonna share that tomorrow morning. A discovery made about uh, 22 months ago, and when I saw it published in the literature, I said, this blows my mind. Hang this on is now, that was, that was Dr. Hugh Ross <laughs> just said that your mind was blown. That's oh, a yeah. big statement. <laughs> and so that's why I said, I gotta write a book on this because I realized this isn't the only one, but I will be sharing tomorrow morning about what I consider to be the most spectacular scientific discovery of the past decade that reveals the supernatural handiwork of our creator. And when I saw this published in the literature, I said, this is something that I think God is gonna use to bring my peers to faith in Jesus Christ. Because they're the ones that discovered it. They weren't believers. And uh, you know, they kind of concluded their paper saying, this I think is a habitability requirement, a way understatement. Anyway, come tomorrow morning, I'll, I'll answer the oh, question. That's a great teaser, I love it. <laughs> okay, let's all stand if you will. Let's give Dr. Ross a big hand, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Hugh. Thank you. I'm gonna invite, uh, any, any of the prayer team that's here tonight, I wanna go ahead and invite you down if, you, if you're here in the prayer team. Uh, again, we're gonna have a dessert reception in the atrium. Stick around for a little bit, even if it's just for a second to go say hi. Dr. Ross and the team, the scholars, have all of their resources out there. The scholars will be out there. Again, an, an opportunity to interact with some of them, ask some really hard questions, and see the resources that are there. Again, we don't get opportunities like this all the time, so take advantage of it. If you're here tonight and you need prayer for anything, something difficult going on in your life, a relationship, a health issue, whatever it would be, let our team pray with you. Or you just have questions about Christianity, the forgiveness of sins, or anything ab about Jesus, let our team interact with you as well and maybe answer some questions. Go in and pray for us and then we'll dismiss. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Lord, again, I thank you for, for Hugh Ross and his team and Lord, just even as we go in fellowship tonight, would you bless the questions and the time of just leaning in and stretching our minds and thinking beyond our, our own little finite wisdom. God, put your hand on us and bless them as well. God, we thank you for church and we thank you for tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you.